Today we'll speak further upon the subject of the life that bites its owner, which we didn't have time to finish yesterday. We should look at the, the wounds that cover our bodies. When you look at a dog that is covered with scars and wounds, how do you feel? Or when you see a person with leprosy whose body is covered with sores, how do you feel? And then we ought to look at ourselves who are covered with all kinds of sores and wounds. And it's kind of funny that these wounds are the result of life biting itself. Yesterday we talked about the burning and scorching of the defilements such as greed, hatred, and delusion. And then we talked about the heaviness of the burden of life. Now we'd like to examine the lack of freedom in life. Everybody's talking about freedom, demanding freedom, struggling for freedom and fighting for freedom. We can, we hear about it in the newspapers all the time people who are insisting that they be given their freedom. And this shows that, first of all, people desire freedom, but second, that they haven't yet gotten freedom. So there's this lack of freedom is the source of a great deal of, of dukkha. There's a secret to this matter which is for the most part misunderstood. So we'd like to have you look very deep into this subject and see where is the lack of freedom? And then again, where is genuine freedom? For example, when we insult or criticize someone, we think that we've got freedom. But in fact, we don't have any freedom because when we're insulting someone, our mind is dominated and taken over by the defilements. And when we're the slaves of the defilements, where can there be any true freedom? or when we're hitting someone, beating them, then we've lost all of our freedom to the defilements, or we've abandoned our freedom to our own stupidity. Why doesn't anybody look at things in this way? And when we kill them, or when we we take the infantry and invade them and then destroy them. In such instances, aren't we just totally losing our freedom to our own stupidity, to our own wickedness and selfishness? Haven't we given up our freedom for these low and crude defilements and stupidity. Why is it that nobody can see things in this way? We're always ready to insult them, criticize them, fight with them, beat them, and even kill them for the sake of our freedom. But this is, this is the, the thinking of lunatics because the more we do such things, 
the more we lose our freedom. If we act in such ways, then we don't have any real freedom at all. It would be good if people could look at this honestly and begin to understand it. Nowadays, we've gone much further than that. We've got these huge armies and these tanks and airplanes and all kinds of <clears throat> missiles and nuclear weapons ready to destroy the freedom of others. We're always ready to fight them or throw our weapons at them to destroy their freedom for the sake of our own freedom. But what do we really get from this? Is the result of all this madness genuine <clears throat> freedom or not? What do we get besides losing our own spiritual freedom from all these, all these weapons and all this military, militarism? We ought to give proper attention to the word spiritual, spiritual, because we think we're getting physical freedom. But at the same time, we're completely losing our, our spiritual freedom. We shouldn't overlook the spiritual side of the picture. When we, when we experience the deliciousness of something, when we're tasting the deliciousness of something, we think that we're getting something, that we have the freedom to experience this deliciousness. But in fact, we have lost our spiritual freedom. We've surrendered our freedom to the, the power of that delicious thing. For the sake of some physical delight, we abandon our spiritual freedom. When we get some sexual pleasures, we think that we've won something, that we've, we've been victorious and gotten some sexual pleasures. But in fact, we've lost our freedom to those very same sexual pleasures. But we never understand this. We never notice the facts. When we love anything, then we lose our freedom to that thing. But common people never understand this. They don't even notice this. They think that they're just getting something, that they're receiving this and that. They never look deeper to see what's really happening. Or on the other hand, in the opposite direction, if we hate something or are angry at something, then we also lose our freedom to that thing. When the mind is full of anger or hatred, why don't we take why don't we take notice that these things are biting us, clawing us, so that we're covered with wounds? Why don't we see that when there is anger or ill will or dissatisfaction in the mind, that we've lost all freedom and are, are biting ourselves, clawing ourselves? Or when we hate someone, then we surrender our freedom to that person. Please, please look at this carefully. Or if we're afraid, afraid of something, then we surrender our freedom to that thing until there's nothing left. Nowadays, we have a world that's full of fear and terror such that there is no spiritual freedom left anymore. 
we can say that now the left is always afraid that it will lose to the right and the right is equally afraid of the left both the left and the right are nervous apprehensive and fearful that they will lose out to the other side and so they are unable to sleep peacefully they're constantly worrying and fretting about this and this has been going on for days months for years the left and the right are constantly frightened by each other and so then we ask the question when we fight when we go to war do we do so for the sake of freedom or do we do so in order to lose our freedom what's the correct answer to this even if we win the battle or the war and get a lot of material benefits in the end we've lost we've surrendered ourselves to the defilement to to mara or to satan so now we're fighting for freedom without understanding that our very actions are destroying our freedom only the mind that is correctly established is free only this properly established mind can maintain its freedom if the mind maintains itself incorrectly for just a bit then it loses its freedom so we must find how how to establish the mind so that it retains its freedom when we don't love anything when we don't desire anything when we don't wish for anything is there true freedom or not or when we're taken over by the values of the positive and the negative are we at all free when the positive values arise then our mind is taken over by greed and lust or if the negative values come up then the mind is lost to anger and hatred if we observe such things we'll start to find out where genuine freedom lies <clears throat> when we have wishes or hopes the same kind of hopes and wishes that we teach our children to have when we have these hopes then our mind has lost its freedom to whatever it hopes for the whole time that there is hoping and wishing living without any hopes or wishes is to live with total freedom but nobody believes this everybody insists that it's possible to live without hopes and wishes we've told you earlier that this is the most artistic thing we can do to live without desires wants and hopes instead to live with freedom to live with mindfulness and wisdom this is the supreme art of living in our dhamma language we call the kind the we describe the life of wishing and hoping as the life of a preta a preta is a kind of being often translated as hungry ghost which is pictured of having a stomach the size of a mountain and the mouth the size of a needle so it's const it's got this huge stomach and it's constantly hungry but a tiny mouth 
they can never satisfy that hunger. This living like a preta is one is how it is when we're full of hopes and wishes and desires. It's a rather low and pitiful kind of existence to live with this constant hunger gnawing on us, all these wishes and desires chewing at us. But still it's a way of life that many people are, are caught quite, quite attached to. Take a good look at the body, the body of these pretas or hungry ghosts these huge stomachs with the hunger of a mountain and mouths tiny like the eye of a needle. How can such a tiny mouth ever fill up such an enormous belly? And so finally we must ask ourselves, are we living like hungry ghosts? So when we live like a hungry ghost, we're being constantly dominated by hunger, by desires. Our mind is full up with these wishes and this hunger. And so this is biting us, biting us so much that we're, we're full of sores and wounds. But we're unable to control this hunger. We can't control these hungry minds. And so we continue being hungry ghosts on and on and on. When we want to love something, we can't control ourselves and fall in love with it. Or when we want to hate something, we're unable to control ourselves and fall into hating that thing. This is where our problem is. We're unable to control things, and so we keep falling into love and hatred. And we get angry so easily, it's like, a, like a flash of lightning, we burst into anger. We flash into anger so easily, so quickly. And then we can't control it, we can't stop it. The anger continues, and we, we feel vengeance and wrath towards others, and we, we store up this vengeance and carry it with us for days, for weeks. Sometimes even these, we carry these vengeful feelings around with us till the end of our life. It's so easy and so fast, this anger. We... <clears throat> We often can't do anything about it. Or when we do something very wrong to someone, we never want to ask for forgiveness. Or if somebody comes to ask our forgiveness, we never want to forgive them. These are emotions which we were unable to control. We can't stop ourselves from feeling ill will or feeling upset by or annoyed by others. So we keep falling into these, these harmful moods because we're unable to control ourselves. And when we can control these, these emotions, then they bite and bite and bite until we're covered with wounds. These wounds may not show on our physical bodies, but they're covering our minds or our spiritual, the spiritual part of our minds. But you needn't worry. If the mind is full of, of these wounds, it won't be long before we get into conflicts and hassles with, with people. And then before long, our bodies will also have their share of sores and lumps and wounds. <clears throat> Please remember that 
being unable to control the mind leads to all these wounds. When the mind can't control itself, then it, life bites and bites and bites. In fact, it's the mind itself that bites itself. The rabid dog keeps biting itself. This rabid mind that can't control itself keeps biting and biting and biting. But if you are successful in your practice of anapanasati, then you'll be able to eliminate all of these problems completely. Anapanasati will have the results of being able to control the mind and being master over the mind in all respects. Next, we'd like to talk about addictions. Addictions are things which entertain or amuse the mind. They're kinds of intoxications which provide a certain amusement or entertainment. When people are amused in this way, they feel that they're really well off. Sometimes they even think that they're in heaven, that these addictions and intoxications are, are paradise. On Gosamui, there's a certain kind of mushroom. In English, they're often called magic mushrooms. And the foreigners who come to Gosamui really like these things. The islanders themselves, however, never touch these things. These mushrooms make you drunk and dizzy, and one doesn't really know what's, what's going on. But they give a certain kind of excitement and stimulation, and the foreigners seem to really enjoy this being drunk and intoxicated by these mushrooms. And so although the villagers don't eat them themselves, they make a lot of money selling these to the crazy foreigners who, who get their kicks from being drunk and, and out of it. The, the islanders themselves consider these mushrooms to be poison, but the foreigners who, who come as tourists think that they're wonderful and, and really marvelous, and so they spend a lot of money on these things. They're willing to give up their, their life and their freedom for the sake of some, some crazy little entertainments and amusements. So now, <clears throat> people really get off on all these addictions and drugs. Alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, even heroin. You can find these all over the place and people really like them. Really hooked on the, the cheap pleasures and thrills of these addictions. But it's kind of interesting that if you look back to before modern civilization came about, back to the people still living in the forests, they didn't have any of these things. They weren't, their lives weren't so centered on things like alcohol and cocaine. They weren't dominated by these things. But look at all our wonderful progress of this modern civilization. Look how we've developed so that people can't live without these, these cheap little pleasures from alcohol, marijuana, and so forth. Things which didn't even exist way back long ago. Please remember one simple sentence. 
dogs don't drink alcohol even though they don't take on any moral precepts. You don't have to make a dog take on a bunch of moral morality rules and still they won't drink alcohol. Thousands of years ago the dogs wouldn't drink alcohol <coughs> even though they never they never talked about morality and even now they still won't drink alcohol and they still don't have to talk about morality but of all the <coughs> of all the addictions there's nothing higher and more powerful than sex we mentioned yesterday how there's an important distinction between sexuality or sensuality and reproduction but the people who are addicted to sex who are really hung up on the pleasures of sex have allowed themselves to be completely absorbed in completely taken over by by sex it's like sexual pleasures have completely infiltrated their minds and dyed their minds so that there's nothing that has more power over them than sex dogs if we observe them <clears throat> can be seen to not really have any sexuality at all for dogs there's just reproduction once a year at the right at a certain season they reproduce and that's about it they're not dominated and taken over by sexuality but human beings are the complete opposite with human beings there's no thought of reproduction human beings are constantly thinking about sex all day long all month long even for the entire year just sex 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 all day and all night this is all most <laughs> human beings think about they never consider reproduction and so dogs where reproduction is a seasonal thing there's no addiction there's especially to to sex but for human beings there's a most powerful and almost total addiction to sex human beings in their in their cleverness have developed something called love play and they've come up with all kinds of tricks and var variations and possibilities for this there are all kinds of books written about it and you can even go and take classes in or have therapy in love play but dogs don't even know anything about all this they they're completely unable to get involved in all this stuff but for human beings love play is something very very important and so why not make a decision make a careful examination and decide for yourself between the two between humans and dogs which of the two is more a slave of the defilements between humans and dogs which are more enslaved to the positive and the negative all religions and all of the moral systems within and without religion are all aiming to save human beings from their addictions no religion wants human beings to be addicted and so there have been various moral teachings to help save humanity from this foolishness this drunkenness but it hasn't been very successful we can see the results of of modern man that's completely full of all kinds of addictions everywhere one looks there the addictions nowadays are so much more 
than 1,000, 2,000 years ago when many of the great religions got started. The difference is so huge, we can no longer even compare the way it is now with the way it was then. So nowadays people have no respect for order, <clears throat> for discipline, for morality, for religion. They really look down on these words, morality, discipline, religion. People just kind of sweep them aside, brush them aside, and enslave themselves completely to addictions. Why not stop for a while and take an honest look and see whether our enslavement to, the, to our addictions to see whether or not, to see whether this is the desire of, of vicha, correct knowledge, or the desire of avicha, ignorance. Are these addictions coming from wisdom, or are they coming from blindness and stupidity? Why not stop and take a careful look at our addictions in this way? when we don't know whether these desires of ours are wise or stupid, that means that we don't even know ourselves. If we can't tell what kind of desires these are, then we don't even know who we are. And so then life keeps biting and biting. This life that doesn't even understand itself keeps biting and biting and biting until it's covered with sores, scars, and wounds. When we don't know ourselves, then we don't understand life. We don't know what life is. We don't know what the purpose of life is. And so life is constantly biting itself. It bites and it bites because there's no real understanding of life because we don't even know what our self is. <clears throat> and so we're constantly, or, and so the result is we're covered with these scars and wounds in such a horrible and pitiful way. It's even more disgusting than someone who has leprosy. This is the state we're, we're in, in more pitiful condition than someone who has leprosy. Now imagine for a moment, imagine what life would be like if it no longer bit itself, if there was none of this biting and all the wounds disappeared. What would that life be like? This life where there's no biting, where there's none of these, the wounds, we call this the life of coolness. It's a cool life, which is the meaning of the word Nibbana. But the life that bites its owner is a life that it has a lot of, has a tremendous attraction and charm. There's something attractive about it that, that pulls us in, tricks us, and addicts us to the life that bites itself. And so for the most part, people are much more attracted to the life that bites its owner, much more than the life that doesn't bite. <clears throat> but even when people begin to get a sense of what's happening and start to lose their satisfaction with this biting and wounded life, even when there's some dissatisfaction, people start to wander around looking for an alternative, but they, they've got no idea where to look. This is quite, quite interesting and strange. There are a number of people wandering around, not really satisfied with their present life, not fulfilled with their present life, but with no real idea where to look 
or where to turn to find something better. You all have come from the West and come to the Far East in order to find the wisdom of the East. If you're able to find this wisdom, it will mean very simply that you have found the life that doesn't bite. As for Buddhism, which is a religion or a system of wisdom from the East, all the knowledge in Buddhism, all the practices in Buddhism, everything that is genuine Buddhism aims solely for achieving or realizing the life that doesn't bite. And the funny thing is that when you find this understanding, when you find this wisdom, it will tell you that don't own life. Don't be the owner of life. Don't try and possess life. Don't take it as being I and mine. Don't make an ego out of life. And then it won't be able to bite. This is what the, the wisdom of the East has to say. Don't become the owner of life. Don't try and possess life. Like we said yesterday, when the, the young child comes up to you and says, please don't be the owner of life. Give it up. Let it go. Don't be, don't be possessive towards life. And then it won't bite you anymore. When the child says this to you, don't slap the child because it's, it's bringing you the highest wisdom. So don't slap the child's face because it's giving you the highest thing, bringing you the highest wisdom of Buddhism. There's a saying which might sound a little bit difficult to some, but it's, it's really not so difficult. Let's see if the translator can get it right. Have without being the owner. To, to have something legally, but without being its, its owner. To have something according to the normal ideas and rules of society, but without really being its owner. For example, you, you have a piece of land. You own some land, you have a deed to it. The, the government, the police recognize that you are the rightful owner of this piece of land and you have a piece of paper and all the formal registration to prove it. <clears throat> but really, it belongs to nature. If you die, you can't take the land with you. And you can't prevent it from changing, from the powers of nature, from changing it. You don't really have that ability. So legally, conventionally, socially, materially, you own it in the ordinary language of, of regular people. In people language, you own it, it's your land. But spiritually, in the language of Dhamma, of the truth, there's no way you could ever own it. Materially, you have some kind of material, conventional ownership but there's no genuine ownership, especially no spiritual ownership. This, this truth and the teaching of this truth 
can be found in the Christian Bible. In the, I believe in 1 Corinthians, in the letter of St. Paul to the people of Corinth, there's a passage where he says, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's something like, have a wife as if you have no wife. Have wealth and possessions as if you have none. Be happy as if you have no happiness. Going to the market, making purchases. Return home as if you purchased nothing. So when we say one ought to have a wife, as if one had no wife. What this means is that in the normal sense one is married. Conventionally one has a wife, but one acts as if one didn't have a wife. Of course we can expand the meaning here to include have a husband, as if you had no husband. Depending on one's sex, it's either have a husband or have a wife. Now what this means here is that though one is married, one has a husband or wife in the ordinary sense, there is no attachment to him or her, her as I or mine. This is what St. Paul meant. You can have a wife or a husband, but don't attach to that husband or wife as I or mine. Otherwise, that husband will bite, that wife will bite over and over again as long as you attach to him or her as I or mine. So, there are two sides to everything. There's the material, conventional, legalistic side. And then there's the spiritual side. Although one may own something materially or conventionally, although one may be the owner in the eyes of the world where ordinary superficial people will say that, oh, this is his wife or her husband. That's just the superficial, material, conventional side. But on the spiritual side, one realizes that there's nothing that can be attached to, that there's nothing that can really be I or mine. And so one, one doesn't attach. One sees the futility of spiritually attaching to things, that if we try to attach, the result is just a lot of biting and wounding and pain. Next we come to wealth and possessions. To have these just as if one didn't have any. This means though one has whatever wealth and property, one acts towards these things as if one didn't have anything. One lets go of the idea that they are ours or mine, that we are the owner of these things. If we don't let go like this, these things will just bite. They'll be very heavy and oppressive. But if one acts towards them as if they weren't even ours, then they have no ability to bite or oppress. <clears throat> and all the other things, such as land, a farm, a house, a car, all the various material things that people own. All of these, we can have them just as if we didn't have them. If we really believe that we own them, then they become very heavy. It's like piling them up on top of our heads and carrying these weights around with us all the time. If we attach to the land as my land, 
the land is no longer out there in the field. The land is stacked on top of our head. And then the house and the car, all these things are piled up on our head, very heavy and oppressive. If they're just the land and we don't act as if we own it, the land is just where it is. It's no longer a burden on our mind. And the same with the house and the car. They're just what they are, but we don't act towards them as if they're mine. And so they're not heavy. They don't make life burdensome and weary. And then there's happiness. Have happiness as if there wasn't any, or be happy as if there wasn't any. This means that there can be joy, satisfaction, and contentment. We can have these feelings of joy and contentment without feeling or acting like we own them. We can be joyful without any idea of owning that joy or happiness. This is very important. Joy is just a natural thing, and there's nothing wrong with it. But if we go and grab onto it as I or mine, it bites. Even happiness can bite us if we attach to it. When happiness comes, if we're clinging to it as I, then we, we fall in love with it, we indulge in it, we get greedy for it, and these, all of these things are biting and biting us. Or if we don't get the happiness, we're not satisfied, and atta if we attach to that, then this leads to anger and hatred and all kinds of ugly moods. If we attach to happiness, it leads to all kinds of attachments to the positive and the negative. It's much wiser to not bother attaching. Just let happiness be a natural <clears throat> feeling. It belongs to nature. There's no need for us to own it and possess it. If we make the mistake of ownership, though, it will bite us unmercifully. Although St. Paul only mentioned these three things, husbands and, or husbands, possessions, and happiness, the principle applies to everything. It applies to friends, to children, to gold, to money, to silver, to beauty, to status, to fame, to honor, to dignity, to everything. The same principle, we can have all these things, <clears throat> but don't attach to them as I and mine. As soon as we make the foolish mistake of ownership, then these things will bite us and wound us. So this, he just mentioned the three, but the idea or the teaching applies to everything. Then there's the fourth example that St. Paul mentioned. Buy something in the market, but don't bring anything home. This is an exact, excellent example of Dhamma language something that in ordinary language may sound confusing, but that when understood in terms of Dhamma has tremendous meaning. It's a kind of Dhamma riddle or puzzle to challenge our intelligence and help us to understand things more deeply. It has the same basic meaning as the first three examples. Go to the market and buy something, but don't bring anything home. The meaning here is very profound about the importance of doing everything, 
that needs to be done, but not attaching to any of it as I or mine. So one has some money and one goes to the market and takes the money and buys something with it. And then one has some, some new, new purchase. But St. Paul warns us not to take anything home. That means though we may have bought something, we don't have any, any foolish ideas about owning it, about it being ours. Physically we may have bought something, but spiritually we relinquish all, all ownership. There's no attachment to it as I or mine. If we really think we own it, if we go and buy things and foolishly think that we own them, that they are mine, then this is going to make us a lot of problems, add tremendous burdens in life, a lot of biting and wounding. But if we understand that it's all part of nature, then we, there's no need to attach to it. We just do what needs to be done. This understanding of buying what's needed but not bringing anything home is an excellent example of the essence of Buddhism. To do what needs to be done without any ideas of I or mine to do whatever must be done without any ownership or any possessiveness. Some people will listen to this and won't be able to understand. People who are not very intelligent will think that this is just some crazy teaching that doesn't make any sense. They'll go, this is ridiculous, go to the market and buy something and not even bring it home. To the stupid person, this teaching sounds very stupid. But the, for those who understand, we see the tremendous wisdom of it. That in purchasing things at the market, it's just like we mentioned with the land. We make the purchase, and so we have the legal right to use something. This is a worldly convention used in society. It has certain practical benefits. But in spite of that legal ownership and right, spiritually there, there's no ownership. In truth, there's no way we could own, ever own, own that. The legal convention is just, is just pretending. If we understand this spiritually, so there's no attaching as I or mine. Then there's no problem. The purchases, the whatever it is we buy, cannot create any problems for us. We can buy whatever we need and none of, that, none of it will bite us. But if we don't understand this, then all these purchases will bite us and claw us. If we can understand this fact, we understand it well enough that we no longer attach to things as I and mine, then we will have understood the essence of Buddhism and will be free of all the biting and wounding. At this, excuse us for interrupting a bit, we'd like to point out something very interesting. All religions aim to save humanity from suffering. All the religions are an attempt to free humanity from suffering. They go about it in different ways. They have different language, different terms to talk about life. But the basic point is the same, to free humanity from suffering. And so, because of this fact, it's possible for all the religions to cooperate, to harmonize. For example, Christianity, which 
puts a tremendous emphasis on faith, on belief. This may be somewhat childish. This may be an emphasis primarily for people who are unable to understand things on their own, and so they have to go and believe what others tell them. But although that may be the emphasis of Christianity, still in Christianity there are teachings of the most profound wisdom, such as the teaching of St. Paul that we've been talking about. And so there's no difficulty in Buddhism and Christianity finding this common ground <clears throat> so that there's, there's no problem in creating harmony between the two religions. There's no need for any conflict or argument between Christianity and Buddhism. This is a point that any real Christian or any true Buddhist should understand and be happy to accept. And for this reason, we're building a place we call the International Dhamma Hermitage. It's across the highway, about, a kilo, about two kilometers away, and we'll take you there on the last day of the course. And this, this hermitage, this International Dhamma Hermitage is being built in order to bring together the different religions so that we can, we can see the points in which we are in harmony and so we can stop getting in arguments and competition. So we'd like to tell you this a bit in advance, that all the religions are <coughs> able to harmonize and to avoid all conflict between them and among them. So the, the mere belief that everything, belong, that everything belongs to God and that nothing belongs to me, this belief in itself will eliminate about 50% of our attachments and then we can continue letting go of attachments until they're all gone. So <clears throat> the belief that's taught in Christianity is a very, can be a very useful way to abandon attachment. And if one understands this correctly, then one can continue a letting go of attachments in this and that so that there's no sense or idea or belief in I or mine remaining. Still thinking that it all belongs to God, that it's not mine, there's still a mine, a me. But if we can let go of all that I and me and mine, even the idea that it's my God or my relationship with God, we let go of all attachment then life is totally free. There's nothing that has any ability to bite life ever again. The heart of Buddhism can be expressed in one short sentence. Sape tamang nalang abhinivesaya. All things ought not to be attached to as I and mine. This one sentence expresses all the truth of Buddhism. In this sentence, the Buddha used the word Dhamma, Dhamma, which we usually translate as thing. But Dhamma here, or thing, should be understood to include everything, everything in the universe both things that are phenomena, both including all phenomena, and also the noumenon, things which are conditioned and that which is unconditioned. That means everything, including nibbana, including absolute truth, whatever we want to call it, should not be attached to as I 
or mine. Literally, the sentence sape tamang nalanga binivesaya can can be translated literally it means all dhammas, all things, which no one ought to interfere with. Apinivesaya means to interfere with, get involved in, meaning to attach to them as I and mine. So there's nothing worth attaching to as mm-hmm. I or mine. The words all things have enormous meaning. All things includes everything without any exception. It includes everything mental and everything physical. And it includes anything that is neither mental nor physical. It includes both the positive, the negative, and that which is beyond or above the positive and the negative. Everything whatsoever, without any exception, should never be clung to, grasped that as I or mine. If we understand this one sentence completely, if we fully understand the meaning here, then we will have understood the most profound Dhamma in Buddhism, as well as the genuine Dhamma in all other religions, the profound truths of Christianity, of Taoism, and any other religion are all contained in this one, this one sentence. Sape tamang nalang apinivesaya. This is a universal truth, a universal law that applies for everything, everywhere, at any time. It's, it's a timeless law. So when we say that it belongs to nature, it doesn't mean that nature is the owner. The ordinary person hears, oh, it belongs to nature, then nature must own it. It must, nature must be the owner. But not even nature can own things. Nothing can be owned by anything else. Everything is completely free of ownership and being owned. When we speak about everything in the universe, it's a little bit beyond our own immediate situation. So we ought to come back and talk more directly about our own reality. And so the essence here is that Nothing in this life, <clears throat> nothing in our own lives should be clung at or grasped at as I or mine. If we stop clinging to our own lives, to everything involved in our lives, then our lives will be completely free and cool. <clears throat> this, these lives of ours are made up of two things body, and mind. If we talk about, if we want to study it, we can distinguish these two aspects, although in reality there's just one thing. You can't really separate the body from the mind. To do so would be to to die. But we can distinguish them for purposes of study, although the reality is just one thing, one life. When we study, when we investigate though our lives, however, we can distinguish between body and mind. And further, we can distinguish various abilities of the mind. So often we talk about life, or we talk about mind-body, or we talk about the five khandas, the five heaps or the five aggregates. There's first the body, and then the mind can, with, as far as the mind goes, we can distinguish four abilities. 
there's the ability to feel, to, to sense pleasure and displeasure regarding experiences. There's the ability to perceive things, to regard them as this, as that, as green, blue, purple, or red. There's the ability to think, to conceive thoughts, and to put them together as thinking. And then there's the very powerful ability of consciousness to directly know experiences via the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind sense. In, for the purposes of study, we can distinguish these five basic functions or abilities of life, body, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness, though in reality it's just one life. And all of these abilities or functions of this life, all of them, according to Buddhism, are, if we attach to any of these five, then that will cause suffering. All dukkha comes down to attaching to one of these five khandhas as I or mine. And so the way to end suffering is to stop attaching to the five khandhas as I or mine. This is another way of expressing the <coughs> fundamental message of Buddhism. So we ask you <clears throat> to do your best to investigate these five khandhas. Look into them until you understand them thoroughly. Understand what they are and how they work. And understand deeply their essential reality, the truth of these khandhas. We've got in these lives of ours, we've got this, this body. And the living, in life, the living body is, is acting, is moving. And this is one function of life. And then when the body is living, there arise feelings of pleasure, displeasure, and neither pleasure nor displeasure. And then there arise perceptions. Things are regarded as being this, that, male, female, positive, negative, or whatever. There arise, when the body is living, there arise thoughts, ideas. And when the body is alive, there arise, there is consciousness via the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind sense. With this living body, there are also these living mental functions or abilities. All together they make up the five khandhas. We, we, we beg you to investigate them until you understand that none of them should be attached to as I or mine. That clinging to the five khandhas is dukkha. That not clinging to the khandhas is, is the end of all dukkha. The highest mindfulness is to know that right now life is taking the form of the body aggregate. To know that right now life is taking the form of the feeling aggregate. Right now that life is taking the form of the perception aggregate. That right now life is taking the form of the thought aggregate. Or that right now life is taking the form of the consciousness aggregate. The highest mindfulness is to know right at this moment what form, what shape, what function life is, is fulfilling or taking. To know this from moment to moment is the highest mindfulness. And from this mindfulness we come to understand the reality of, of life itself. And then we see that there's nothing that can be clung to as I or mine. There's nothing to be, that can be owned. 
that ownership is impossible. There's nothing that can be the owner, and there's nothing that is able to be possessed. Seeing this is the highest wisdom. And so with the highest mindfulness and the highest wisdom, we are free of, of, all, of all biting, of all suffering. So the highest mindfulness and wisdom is knowing that life is not ego. Knowing that there's just this life happening naturally, or that there's just body and mind, or just the five khandhas. But none of it is ego, none of it is self or soul. Realizing that there's just life, and none of it is I or mind, self, ego, soul, spirit, atman, or whatever you want to call it. Realizing this, then life is totally free. Life no longer bites. Life can no longer be bitten when there is this highest wisdom. So all suffering is gone. All suffering has been quenched. This is the the highest wisdom and the highest realization that a human being can, can attain. And at this point then, everything is, is finished in terms of one has accomplished everything that needs to be accomplished. And so we'll close the meeting at this point. Thank you for being very good listeners, very patient, and if you can put up with some more, come back tomorrow and we'll have another talk. <laughs> and that's all for today.